Hello and welcome back to the Barefoot Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Thompson, the Barefoot Podiatrist. And with me today, I'm here to answer, or not me specifically, but I've got someone here to answer all the questions you keep throwing at me around kinesiology tape. So I have with me physiotherapist of over 20 years experience. So you should take note of this guy. He's got a fair bit of uh, experience behind him, a bit of knowledge in this area. Steve Stahl is the uh, director or one of the directors at Rock Tape Australia and lead instructor. Now, Rock Tape Australia is one of the big brands that deal with uh, kinesiology tape. So like I said, he's here to help us understand and get our heads around what kinesiology tape is, the science, all the bits and pieces you keep asking me. We're going to find out today more about this. Plus, if we have time, we'll have a quick chat about some of the other products that I've been using from uh, Rock Tape as well that also help with movement and improving uh, well, whole body health, but definitely lower limb and, and gait stuff that we talk about uh, here around feet and movement. So I'm excited to talk with, with you today, Steve. Thanks for being here. No worries. Thanks for having us. Mate, I'm, I'm stoked. This is exciting. I've done a lot of <laughs> courses through you guys, so it's good to kind of, um, yeah, sort of pass on this knowledge from more first-hand experience of some of the, yeah, we get asked a lot about, you know, is kinesiology, kinesiology tape, does it work? Is it good? You know, how do I use it? So, you know, my little brain can only hold so much info. This is your thing. I'm really excited to deep dive, yeah. deep dive into this. So just give us a little bit, a bit about you. Who are you? What do you do? Yeah, I'm a physio. Um, I work in um, private practice Monday to Thursday, pretty much my clinical load. And then, um, you know, since since the last, well, probably 10 years or so, 10 or 11 years, we've had uh, rock tape in Australia. And so my Fridays, not all Fridays, Saturday, Sunday, but uh, a fair bit of them, is, uh, a fair bit of that time is spent doing um, rock tape related stuff, sometimes courses, um, sometimes just answering emails, questions, etc. cetera. Uh, um, setting up courses um, and then obviously liaising with uh, with our US counterparts on uh, on research and new developments and things like that as well so yeah and if I'm not doing all of that then I'm usually running or surfing or out on the bike or doing something as active as I can so awesome. yeah so you live it as well yeah, absolutely. Oh, definitely all about movement and uh, yeah, try. I've got to practice what you preach as well. So it's really important. Definitely. So rock tape, just give us, before we jump into kind of the kinesiology side of it, you know, rock tape is obviously a brand and, and comes out of the States, I'm guessing. Just give us a little bit of, um, bit of a background about rock tape and kind of where it's come from, what you guys are about. Yeah, so initially it was, uh, I think about 2009, um, Greg Vandendries is a US-based a US um, entrepreneur and uh, inventor type fellow who had some background in garment technology, um, smart garments and things like that. Um, around about that time, he was doing some Ironman triathlon training, um, got injured, as people do when they're doing long distance sort of training had some kinesio tape applied by his practitioner and thought this is great, but it kept falling off when he went to do all these long distance, you know, athletic stuff, running, cycling, swimming. So he thought, you know, this, this is a great product. It's a great concept. We need to kind of build on this and, and make it better. And so he set out to make it a, a better product in, in terms of uh, certainly for athletics, but in, by making it better for athletes, he kind of made it better for everybody because we all swim and, you know, shower and, uh, you know, have put the tape through various challenges. And particularly when we're talking about feet and lower limb stuff, there's, um, you know, lots of challenges to the, the actual uh, longevity of the tape and the robustness of the tape. So he kind of set about doing that, had a garage full of tape, uh, but he's not a medical person. So he, uh, he had a garage full of tape and no one to kind of use it for him. So, 
he approached one of his local um, chiropractors, just walked in and said, I need to see Steve Capabianco. Um, the reception was like, do you have an appointment? He's like, nah, I just need to see this guy. So straight off the street, uh, they got chatting and kind of had similar similar vibe on uh, on what this stuff could be used for. And uh, yeah, Steve Capabianco remains the, the medical director in uh, of the US company, the parent company of, um, of Rock Tape. Uh, so still heavily involved and it's a lot of his work that you know we've built on over the years and he's definitely the, uh, you know, the driving force behind all our education and a lot about you know he, his handle on Instagram is the fascia doc or actually just fascia doc no the so at fascia doc yeah. and uh, he's constantly posting stuff about movement touch you know he, he's a real sort of uh, movement geek he would say quite happily um, and so he he's really been the, the sort of the driver behind our education and then we've got you know bounce ideas off each other in terms of research and, and things like that and you know we have inputs back to the US um, and now we've got you know quite a strong collective of people in Europe as well and so yeah, once a year we have the arduous task of uh, all getting together in Mexico, uh, which we've done four or five years now, and uh, it's a very tough weekend, a lot of work, and uh, yeah, it's a horrible place. It's you know first first weekend in January normally, not last year obviously with COVID, but um, yeah, otherwise it's uh, you know for me I I'm, I'm, I'm go from summer fly over, you know it's thirty degrees and you know it's summer leaving. In shorts and t-shirts and live in shorts and t-shirts while I'm there for a few days but uh, obviously for the North American crew they all come down in ski jackets and snow boots and stuff and you know I think they think it's fantastic to have a midwinter escape in uh, you know somewhere in a Mexican resort town so yeah so that's where we kind of all put our heads together and uh, and plot out the next year's um, education the improvements the changes the research updates um, new products and all that sort of stuff so yeah it's grown from a you know a one guy operation in his garage a garage full of tape um to being kind of a yeah worldwide company and, and certainly the you know the mantra is that we are a movement company um obviously the tape is our biggest seller and it's in the name rock tape but uh you know everything that we have is really about movement and getting people to move more often and and, and certainly move better so yeah when i yeah. first came across you guys years ago um i couldn't even guess how many years ago when i first um i mean kinesiology tape wasn't really like for me through uni it wasn't something they really spoke about way back then in the dark ages when i went through uni um i'm sure it was around but it just wasn't something we used really and it wasn't until several years after graduating that sort of rock tape kind of came on the scene for me and doing the first course with you guys um it was pretty evident even back then that yeah you were selling tape and you were trying to make a really good tape product but it was more about really helping educate people on how to use this stuff properly and the research behind it and you know there was a really big drive behind the education part which um even back then i, I thought it was really cool i thought it was you know like the tape was just almost like a a secondary thing that um, even though that was obviously your main product and what you were kind of selling the the education was um premium you know it was first class education it was it was a really good course even way back back then i'm sure it's come even further you know and come a long way since then but yeah the education stuff that you guys do is great really cool yeah thanks and that's certainly the the feedback that a lot of people you know, say, you know, not just here, but in the US and everywhere else is that, yeah, gee, that was more than a tape course or more than a blades course or whatever, yeah. because it's, yeah, it's pain science and it's movement and it's, you know, very brain based neurocentric sort of stuff um, mm. rather than just come along and we'll show you how to put tape on a calf or a knee or, you know, this is the only way you can do it. It's like, no, just, you know, understand the, the principles and the concept behind it. And you've got, you know, limitless applications then because you, you kind of get the why, not just the how, you know, yeah. you, can get, you can get the how off YouTube if you want to. Mm. Um, you've 
want to really understand the the why behind it for for all these different modalities to to kind of complement you know the way that people practice um, and you know the, all of our products are are an adjunct to movement and manual therapy and that you know none of them are going to be a standalone treatment they're all going to be something that you kind of you know add into what you do um, mm. to to complement what you do. Because like for me as a podiatrist. Um, and probably still, but even like back then when I was, um, you know, looking at rock tape and all this stuff, I've always been an outsider in my industry in that I've always been more movement driven. You know, I want to try and rehab feet and lower limbs and fix gait, not just prop it up with um, supports all the time. And like, I think pro like, I mean, I was trying to research and do things even back then, but I'd say a big push for me that really kind of even got me on this path I'm on even more so or really kind of clicked that there was people out there that were teaching stuff that I kind of thought we should be kind of trying to put into practice somehow, but didn't know how to do it um, was through that initial rock tape course. You know, you guys were taping movement, not taping pain or, you know, trying to stop movement to fix the pain. Like you were actually taping things in, in, a, in a way that would help facilitate better movement or, you know, make that joint move more. Like there was just, it really clicked with me and I've loved, you know, I've loved using, um, well, kinesiology tape for many years. And that's why I wanted to get you on today and, and talk with rock tape. Cause I've tried lots of different brands over the years as well. And rock tape is one I keep coming back to cause it works. Like you said, it, it sticks. <laughs> you know, some of them, yeah. um, I mean, they're all kinesiology tape. It's like, there's lots of different brands of everything out there. Um, but you'll find those ones that just seem to work better. Um, and depending on what you, you know, I, I like um, water sports as well. I surf as well. Um, and lots of my clients are on the beach and get sweaty and wet. So, you know, for thing for a tape, like rock tape to stick so well, it makes it easier for me as a practitioner <laughs> to then help these people keep this stuff on, you know, if it's going to actually stick, not a day later, it starts peeling off and then the treatment you've done you know, it doesn't last as long. So yeah, I can definitely vouch for this product. It's, it is good tape. So tell us about kinesiology tape. What's the, what's the theory behind it? How does it work? Yeah, so it's probably evolved. Well, it definitely has evolved. So it was invented in the 1970s by Kenzo Kaze, who was a Japanese chiropractor. And so his, his brand is Kinesio Tape. He may have sold it now, but uh, he's still involved in it. And so his philosophy back in the seventies, he had a few things that he thought it did. And, you know, like everything from that era, you know, in terms of uh, manual therapy, physiopodiatry, et cetera, the philosophies we had then compared to what we know now, you know, it's changed quite a bit. So, um, and that's where people really, I suppose, get turned off kinesiology tape is probably listening to some of those older outdated sort of ideas that, you know, if you take the muscle in this direction, you'll activate it. And if you tape it in that direction, you'll inhibit it. And it's like, well, you've actually got a piece of elastic. It's going to recoil towards the middle. You can't make it kind of pull one way or the other very easily. There's a couple of little tricks you can do, but as a general principle, if you're just taping it from one end of the muscle to the other, it's going to recoil towards the middle. So people kind of got a bit lost with some of their philosophies and kind of, you know, it just doesn't pass the common sense test. So um, the, the whole premise of it really is, you know, you've got something on the skin. If you're changing the inputs to the brain, then you can change the outputs. Now, certainly that can be pain. And, and we talk about the pain gate theory, you know, you bang your elbow on the door and the first thing you do is, is rub it because that, kind of an instinctive reaction of giving you a, a more pleasant sensation rather than the, the fact you just bang your arm. Um, so we've got this kind of, you know, evolving pain science thing where pain gate theory is kind of a little bit out of date and it's all pain neuromatrix and stuff now, but it still really fits in that you've got a, a competing stimulus or a distracting stimulus and therefore we can change the pain experience, uh, the nociceptive drive um, to the brain. So really if we think of it through that kind of lens it makes perfect sense you know that's really what we do with a lot of our manual therapy treatments is try and provide some kind of neuromodulation get a window of opportunity to then make a change to provide another input or stimulus to you know get someone walking better or you know change their gait pattern change the way that they're using certain muscles or actually 
being able to use certain muscles, finding them, connecting the dots between that area of the body and the brain. So if we think of it more like that, then, you know, it's really hard to argue against it rather than thinking about, oh, you know, we can make this happen or that happen by the way, the direction that we put the tape on. Uh, so really the, the, the whole premise of it is using an elastic piece of tape, create a little bit of a, a lifting sense on the skin, a decompressive type effect. Um, how important that is, we haven't really had anybody kind of do a physiological study and, and demonstrate that, except to say, as I said at the start, you know, change the inputs up to the brain, you'll get a different output back to the tissues and therefore we can, you know, increase activation or decrease pain or increase range of movement. Um, it's just a, a change in that neural stimulus. Um, mm. And the good thing about tape is that, you know, you can do all that with your hands in the clinic and then they walk out the door. So if you can tape them in a way that replicates what you kind of facilitated with your hands or some other instrument or implement in the clinic, then they can do that for three to five days. So if we have this low level stimulus there for three to five days, we might get some neuroplastic changes through repetition because our brain loves repetition. Obviously, the more you do something, generally the better you get at it, skill acquisition type principles. Yep. Um, so having that lasting effect, something that's breathable, low allergy, um, you know, acrylic adhesive, all the kinesiology tapes are a some form of acrylic adhesive. Uh, obviously, as we said, you know, some are better than others, but the basic premise of them is that they are low allergy um, and the, they're thin, so they, they can, you know, let moisture out if you're sweaty. Uh, once you have a shower, you pat it dry and it dries. So it really is a, a low irritable, uh, low irritability on the tape. And therefore, you know, you can have it on for longer. So mm. often with the, the rigid tapes, you know, we can, we can make a change and we can put them on, but people don't tolerate it long, you know, 24 hours or so. And oh, I've got to get this thing off. It's, it's driving me nuts. So and once it's wet, um, normally the skin goes pretty gross. Yeah, it macerates, goes that, yeah, white sort of skin when you peel it off. And mm. so, you know, that's the good thing about the kinesiology tape is that people tolerate it well. Um, and I guess the main thing for most practitioners is getting their head around it's not a mechanical tape. You know, we can, we can do it, use it as a quasi-mechanical tape sometimes if needed and give people a little sort of extra impetus in a certain spot by, by putting a bit of extra stretch on the tape and, and kind of pulling it a bit tighter. But as a general principle, we're not trying to, you know, lock something up or, you know, feel that it's a, a restriction of mechanical forces. And that's, you know, that's what tape, sort of, a rigid tape will do a little bit. Bracing can do, orthotics can do, um, and that might have its place at certain times. But in a lot of cases, if we can get people moving and moving, people will move around pain. If we can reduce their pain, we can get them moving in the way that they want to or should do um, mm. and, and get them moving properly. So, yeah, if, if we can sort of get people to think it's not a mechanical tape, take that out of the, the picture altogether and think of it as a, a change in input, and change in output, then, as I said, then it starts to make sense. Um, so, mm. you know, certainly with podiatry, you know, if we, if we show somebody, show some podiatrists, you know, this is how we tape for, you know, plantar pain uh, and, you know, put a piece of tape along the, the foot and maybe one or two pieces sort of a transverse across the foot and, you know, with the foot on stretch to start with, you know, dorsiflexion of ankle and toes. So they're like, but that's not going to take the force off the plantar fascia. I'm like, I know <laughs> it's not <laughs> yeah. supposed to, you know. Um, so that's the real hard sell, particularly, you know, physios, podiatrists and, and probably other manual therapists who've used rigid tape as a, you know, as an offload, mechanical offload device. Then, yeah, you kind of, it's just a, a different sort of space to be in with this sort of tape. And, and one is not always better than the other, but, you know, horses for courses, some people respond well to, to a short-term bout of rigid taping, bracing orthotics, and then move to, to sort of movement stuff, you know, yeah, once pain sure. settled, perhaps. Yeah. No, I agree. And I, see, it's funny, though, because I think once you understand movement more too, even though it's not a mechanical tape, like you said, you can use it in ways that, you know, if you're giving someone exercise, it's almost like guidance, right? If you're yeah. trying to get them to hold their foot in a certain way, 
through exercises and you can tape that foot or the knee, whatever, in a way that gives them that proprioceptive awareness of how to potentially hold that body in a different, a different way, having that guidance of the tape, it doesn't just hold it there. It's more just like a, a feedback. Like you said, it's that input of, of trying to feel like it's pulling you a certain way that then your brain will then try and activate things to actually you know, use that part differently or, or hold it differently. So I think there's definitely ways of using it that can have some pretty cool mechanical effects. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we, we, in our courses, we obviously teach certain applications. We don't just kind of rely on here's the principles you've got to make it up. Like we'll give you some common garden variety sort of, you know, starting points, I guess. Mm. Here's, here's one way to tape a knee, one way to tape a foot, one way to tape a calf or a shoulder. But, you know, the, not everyone will respond to that because no one responds to everything all of the time. So you've got to have that ability to kind of flex and go, all right, patient you know maybe we need to do it this way because everyone's wiring slightly different you know everyone's yeah. backstory is different in terms of what got them to you in the first place so mm. you know one size will never fit all um, and that's the beauty of tape in terms of just being able to tweak it this way or tweak it that way uh, rather than just being kind of a, a middle of the curve application that you yeah, know it'll probably help 60 percent of people but you'll miss the you know the two ends altogether. Mm. And with um, pain, like you'll see, you know, you guys will put um, pictures up of like trauma where there's intense bruising or swelling. How does the tape affect those like real acute cases? Because some of the pictures are pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, the pictures are really dramatic. And, and you know, to be honest, from a research point of view, no one's really looked at that in a great deal of, uh, you know, a scientific... Um, depth to say what happens why does it do this so generally the the accepted sort of you know theory if you like is that we get the the convolutions on the skin so when we when we apply the tape with light stretch we stretch the body part so if you've rolled your ankle we would take it into a you know say an inversion sprain so you've twisted rolled it the usual way the common way you would try and put the foot in a way that the tissue is on a little bit of stretch apply the tape over the top of it. So when you come back to neutral, you get this lifting effect of the, the tape on the skin. So we get that sort of wrinkling effect. And the idea is that creates a, a pressure, pressure differential. So we've got, uh, if people have seen the swelling or bruising taping, we usually do it as a, we call it a jellyfish approach, but it's basically a fan cut. So we cut the, the tape into little strips. So it has an anchor point that's the usual five or 10 centimetre width. And then it has, you know, four, six, eight, however many you cut it into, um, little tails off that. So when we remove it, particularly over bruising, bruising's are, you know, that's the mm. Instagram image where everyone sees yeah. the dramatic change. Uh, so when we remove that, you know, 24, 48 hours later, where the tape has been, there's less bruising or no bruising. And where the tape hasn't been, there is bruising. So it creates those real sort of channels. And, you know, if you Google rock tape bruises, you'll see plenty of before and after pictures. Um, but as I said, it, it, the actual science behind that is, is a bit, you know, it's a bit sketchy. It works, but how does it work? No one's really dived down into that. So if we talk about the pressure differential thing, if, you know, cr we create areas of uh, decompression, that would sort of indicate that that would be a lower pressure. Fluid should flow from high to low. So that should clear in between the tape, not under the tape. So it's not really that. There might be some pressure differential that creates the difference, but it's not necessarily that, you know, the skin is lifted, therefore it's low pressure. Um, people have done sort of science uh, experiments of looking at skin thicknesses at the two ends of the tape and trying to do ultrasound images is like in between the, the tape um, pieces of tape and see what happens to the different layers. We definitely can see imaging of decompression. So it does sort of expand that subcutaneous area. So whether that just promotes better lymphatic flow out from that area and that takes all the, you know, well, not all, but a lot of the, the sort of waste products away with it. Um, so yeah, jury's out on exactly how and, you know, all that sort of deep stuff, but you know, the proof is in all those pictures, really, that it, yeah. it can clear bruising. Um, and obviously, biology is biology. So, you know, that doesn't mean you're 
uh, calf strain, your grade two calf strain is going to take less time to fully rehab. Um, but if we can get some of that fluid out of the way, um, clear the bruising, clear the, the swelling more quickly, it's certainly more comfortable because all that sort of congestion and all that extra pressure is painful. So, you know, you can get moving on your rehab. You've still got to wait for the appropriate timeframes, obviously, to, you know, resume strength and resume, you know, sporting sort of stuff to, to actually get back to sport. Um, but we can get you on the journey a little bit more comfortably, more quickly mm. as well. Right. And then with the so typical just strains and aches and pains where you're, you're taping, so that's more that it decompresses the skin and gets more blood flow. Is that why, like I know there's also the neuroceptor stuff you were saying that can change pain, like input versus output, but is some of that blood flow as well that might be helping heal quicker? Yeah. And- Again, the blood flow one's a bit contentious, like superficial blood flow, you know, absolutely could, uh, you know, could be involved in that clearing of bruising um, or, but even just for normal, you know, common garden variety sprains and strains and things. But the, the actual decompressive effect on the, the skin, so the mechanical lift, if you like, that the, the tape could create is really going to only be quite shallow. So if you're talking about, a, you know, say a soleus that's quite deep, then you think, well, it's not going to probably have enough change on blood flow deep there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be definitely more working on the, the superficial tissues and, and whether it gets much beyond, you know, the, the deeper fascia overlying the gastroc even before we get down to, to the soleus. Um, so probably not deeper blood flow. Um, the, the studies certainly don't support any change in deep blood flow. I think the only one who's ever found got good blood flow changes was, uh, you know, when Kenzo Kaze did a study and that's kind of conflicted. So we probably should disregard that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but there hasn't really been much independent research to improve, you know, blood flow. However, there are, there are some interesting studies like where they, there was one that was an MRI study where they taped over tibialis anterior. Uh, you know, before they did the MRI, they, they did a, a pre-taping one. Then they pulled the person out, put the tape on their leg, put them back in the machine and compared, it's only like five people, so it's low power, but compared the cross-sectional area of uh, the whole lower limb. And the lower limb, even the gastroc and the soleus were a different cross-sectional area in the post um, MRI with the tape on compared with pre-taping. So something's changed which presumably is neural driven. So if the tissue has relaxed more or changed its resting tone, then that could allow for some blood flow changes. So it's probably like an indirect secondary thing that then assists with, with healing. So yeah, you take the front of the leg and the muscles in the, in the posterior compartment can even be changed. So um, yeah, could that I think be it's- fascia it, driven? You know could how, be like, fascia driven? Could be fascia. They say is very- you know, neural, if you change the yeah. fascia on one side, and they say, you know, you pull one bit, you know, yep. on one side and the other part will also move. It's all you know, like a spider yeah. sort of thing. Could that be absolutely a, and, a theory? and has a, yeah, and has contractibility as well. The um, the myofibroblasts that live in the, the fascia, like we have a, a, a fascial tone. So, you know, when you are applying tape to one isolated body region if that affects the fascial tone you know in that area well perhaps it you know relaxes the fascial network in that whole lower limb you know if not Mm. kind of spreading further than that so so there's you know elements of that 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 could be involved in saying all right well how does this little piece of tape on the skin how does it have in some people such profound changes uh, and obviously the you know the the big one would be neural because that can be so quick you know you can do yeah. some of those little neural hacks that people do where you know here do this little movement for 10 times and then reassess that and oh wow your hamstrings are, are longer you know you've increased the length of your hamstrings so we know that neural mediation can be like almost instantaneous mm. um, the fascial changes the fascial tone stuff's a little bit slower um, probably you know minutes to hours rather than like 20 seconds but you know if you've got tape on for three to five days there's certainly time for that to have some um, change on the fascial tone and yeah potentially assist with healing through allowing blood flow or you know something along those lines so there's a lot we don't know 
you know, about the body basically, but, yeah, you know, true. in, yeah, in how does this affect that? You know, how do we get from there to there? Um, yeah, there's some big leaps that people make. Um, and in the absence of actually having, you know, some, some pathways that we, we know these ones, we don't know those those ones um, that's where people can kind of you know insert all sorts of mysterious theories and and you know magic potion sort of stuff but you know we, we'll find out we'll find out eventually i guess uh, is there much research you know, around on on like kinesiology tape rock tape like is there much out yeah there? there is unfortunately not much that's really good yeah. <laughs> same as a lot of a lot of research like um you know every uh, probably every week I would get, you know, journal alerts and, and you know, Google alerts of, uh, of different um, studies that have been published. And, you know, you click, click on and, and not that you should, you know, read the abstract, but you read the question, you know, uh, and you think, well, why are you comparing that to that? You know, why, yeah. why would we bother? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, so, and unfortunately, most of the time they are still referencing, you know, the 1970s kind of theory, if you like. So, you know, they're, they're referring to, um, you know, the, the outdated things and, and testing those. And we're like, no, we've already discarded that. You know, we, we don't, we know that that's not we've moved valid. On. <laughs> yeah, we've moved on from there. And, and so it's, you know, it'd be kind of like, you know, getting something that we know, you know, we know so much more about tendons now than we did you know, when I went to uni, which was, you know, 25 years ago or something, you know, the, the way we treat tendons has completely changed. Um, so it'll be like people publishing research now going, oh, when I was at uni, I learned that, you know, you can deep friction a tendon. And now, you know, most people go, oh, you know, tendons don't like massa, heavy massage on them. So it'd be like publishing papers, you know, on does deep frictioning tendons work? And you're like, no, no, we, we've done that. We know that, you know, we're in the most, most from everyone, if something works for everyone. But, yeah. you know, for most people, the majority, leave it alone and, you know, and strengthen the, the whole muscular tennis unit. That's yeah. where we've moved to. So, yeah, it frustrates me no end that uh, we get, you know, so much garbage research. Um, and, you know, each year when we when go to Mexico and we discuss the, the research, there, there might be half a dozen articles out of, you know, 800 that have been published that year that are actually worth talking about and, yeah. you know, putting into the presentations and, and saying, you know, this, this has got some, some good nuggets in it. Um, <laughs> so, insane, you know, and they, they talk, yeah, they talk about, you know, if you, if you actually tried to keep up with the research of everything, you'd, you'd spend like 20 hours of your day reading research articles. Um, yeah. You know, there's so much being produced and, and, you know, unfortunately it's quantity over quality most of the time. Um, and yeah, you just get very fatigued trying to sort through, you know, all the garbage to get to the good stuff. So yeah, I get it all the time. People send me stuff on feet and gait and lower limb and shoes all the time. And 90% of them, it's the same thing. And I was sponsored by someone who has a vested interest in getting a certain result and straight yeah. away you pick apart all the holes and you're like, well, this doesn't, <laughs> what does it tell us? Yeah. Yeah, this is nothing. This is actually just, it's just fluff, you know, like it's, for the right person, it might look good and help sell something. But on the other hand, when you're actually trying to look at, you know, moving forward and new ways of doing things, sometimes research can get very overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. And it's been I, an interesting thing. I like thing. clinical stuff better, personally. Like I find, yes. you know, seeing and talking to other clinicians and finding, I mean, research is important. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, some people love science and, and we need research. But seeing what's working clinically, and then you start seeing it firsthand and, you know, bouncing off other clinicians, it's pretty powerful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And ideally, you know, the clinical stuff would drive the research um, as well. You know, it, it should be a, you would a hope, sort yeah. of circular <laughs> thing. You'd hope. But, you know, as I said, sometimes we're so, you know, we, we've, we've, the research stuff's coming from a long way back and you just think, oh, wow, you know, like I said, we've moved on from that. We should be mm. testing, you know, like with all the neuroscience, pain neuroscience advancements, you know, that, that's where... I think people should be researching some of this sort of, um, you know, the tape applications or, or you know, whatever neuromodulation uh, tools we can have. But mm. uh, yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem to kind of catch up too quickly. But 
uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is really important to have it. Uh, mm. Interestingly, over our courses, you know, we, we've got the, the research as much as we can sort of sprinkled in and we discuss it. And uh, probably, two, probably five years ago, you know, everyone really wanted to know where's the evidence, where's the evidence. Um, and now we get a lot of feedback in the courses, ah, oh, too much research, you know, we don't want it. We just, it's like, oh, okay. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's fine. Well, you know. too heavy. Back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Just tell us so, what to do. Jeez, come on, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's the Instagram thing, isn't it? You just want that instant sort of thing. I don't want to have to think. You know, just tell me how. Um, but yeah, like I said, we, we want you to know the why as well. So, yeah, how do yeah. I reproduce that jellyfish one? Because it was really good on Instagram. <laughs> and I need to that's make right. That happen. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So, with, um, with the taping, um, just a couple more questions. Who is it for? Like age groups? Is this something we can use on anyone? Are there restrictions on who you may use it for? And yeah, not, yeah, go, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, uh, go I'm for diving it, on yeah. that spot. Yeah. Um, so not really. Like we've got you know pediatrics to geriatrics um, in terms of people using it. Um, but we do have a you know more gentle tape. So there's a standard rock tape, and then there's the what we call rock tape RX, which is just the the more gentle version, and which just a little less adhesive strength, so a little less aggressiveness. And then we've got the H2O, which is kind of the water-based one, which is a bit more sticky, good for feet, glue. good for yeah, good for podiatry, uh, you know, feet, good for warm environments, you know, humid, sticky, um, to make sure it sticks before you know people do too much. Um, but certainly we've got, you know, loads of people who like from sort of neonatal stuff, um, infants with nasogastric um, feeds that are using the, the tape to stick the, the line across, you know, their, their little toddler or infant's face. So that's how sort of gentle it can be because they find that mm. the, the Fixamol, uh, which is often what's compared to in terms of adhesive quality, is just like tears the skin when they're removing it. So they generally yeah. will use, you know, the standard rock tape because they like the patterns, the rainbow and all that sort of stuff they like to use to brighten things up. Um, so, you know, it shows it can be used in a very sensitive environment. Um, and yeah, I use it on my sort of older clients quite happily. Um, skin integrity issues are the main sort of caution, I guess. Um, yeah. So people, people with tape allergies are generally okay with, with the kinesiology tapes because they're acrylic and tape allergies are typically to the zinc oxide adhesives of rigid tape. But if people are, have a history of you know, sensitivity, then we usually just use a little test patch somewhere. Just go stick that on, no stretch, see how you go for a day or two. If it reacts, then you are one of the, you know, 1% or 5%, whatever the number is, that are truly allergic to the, the acrylic adhesive. Um, but most of the time, it's the, the extra stretch people apply with the tape that's probably the biggest uh, cause of skin reactions. So that's it's normally an application. Yeah, and too, too much tension. So then we get, you know, if we put the tape on, because it's got stretched, because it almost doubles in length, people who are used to taping for mechanical things and using rigid tape generally want to pull all the stretch out of the tape. And what we want is the person to be able to move and utilise the stretch and the recoil and not hit the end point. So if we put it on with a whole lot of tension and then they move, particularly the two ends, that they will have a lot of traction on the skin. Um, so around shoulders, particularly the front of the shoulder is a really good spot to give someone a skin irritation. Um, fortunately, lower limbs are pretty good because the, you know, the feet and the you know, ankles, calves, et cetera, are pretty tough. Knees are not too bad. The inside of the knee can be a bit sensitive. Um, but yeah, generally it's more about trying not to go too aggressively with the stretch, but the actual, tape itself can be used from you know basically birth through right through to the you know 90 year olds quite happily no problems i've got a, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old and they're barefoot that's just what we do so we're big on movement we're big on keeping things you know strong and moving and and they know that that's kind of that's they've just grown up knowing that and if they like get a little roll on their ankle or they you know something happens i'll throw some rock tape on them that's the magic tape we have at home that it might stay on them for 10 minutes, yeah. an hour, depending on the injury. They'll tell me when it's fixed. Oh, dad, I think it's fixed. I'm like, okay. 
when it comes yeah. off it, <laughs> I find it, yeah, for me, it hasn't irritated them. Um, it's been really good. And yeah. for me personally, with what I do and what I kind of, my beliefs on movement, it keeps them moving. I'm not locking stuff up. I'm not, you know, limiting their movement. For me, it's just, you know, well, I just did it one day because he was crying, he'd sort of really busted himself up. So I did something, put this magic tape on him. And instantly he said, oh, the pain feels better. So whether that was placebo, whether it was actually the, you know, there was a change in input that changed the output. Um, but yeah, too, I'll, I'll use that on, on my kids um, whenever they do kind of come unstuck on their, their skateboard or <laughs> something yeah. really happens. That's the magic tape we use, which, like I said, hasn't irritated them. And it seems to, seems to solve the tears problem, which is the main thing. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And if there is a placebo element to it, well, you know, that's okay if it gets them moving. Uh, you know, I think people are a bit frightened of that too. Like, oh, you know, it's just a placebo. But if I put it on and it makes someone feel more confident, more comfortable to move, and we don't sort of, you know, oversell when I put it on. When I put an application on the clinic, I'll just kind of say, look, some, this helps some people. It doesn't help everyone. Let's try it for a few days. We've got nothing to lose. Mm. Uh, you tell me next time when you come back if you felt like it, you know, helped or not. And then we'll either continue to use it or, you know, go with something else. But you know, if it is purely in their mind, if it's mind over matter, I don't think it matters to, to get going. You know, I wouldn't yeah. keep then saying, oh, you have to keep using it. It's a, it's a point in time thing. Let's use it for a couple of weeks while you do your exercises. As soon as you feel like you don't, you need it. Fantastic. Let's take it off. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm happy to embrace that side of it. If, you know, and, you know, I always say to people, if the, the only thing it does is make someone do their exercises, it definitely does that as well. Because when they get out of the shower and they go, oh, I've got that tape on my foot or tape on my knee or tape on my shoulder. As you're drying yourself, you're like, oh, I'm going to do those exercises, you know. So, yeah. you know, if nothing else, it's a visual reminder from the therapist to the patient to do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> so that's, that's a good that thing with, too. Um, with exercises, just helping people, you know, stand in a better way they might be loading their foot in a funny way or something we're trying to do some exercises to change how they're standing even just taping the foot in a certain way i find has a similar effect i'll come back and haven't done their exercises but oh for that week the tape was on you know the amount of times i corrected how i was standing and tried to activate my foot and you know had done what i'd said to do just because it was there and they felt that little bit of stretch or you know it reminded them yeah. and they just alter how they were you know standing whether they did the exercise or not was a different story but yeah, it's pretty cool that it does that. Um, and I'll find, again, whether it's placebo or not, sometimes it's depending on the client and kind of how, um, you know, you can sometimes pick those people that just some things might seem a bit airy fairy to them. Other people are really into, they already know about K tape and want to, they want it, you know. The ones that you seem a bit off, you know, might seem a bit kind of like it's airy fairy. I would just say, look, you know, I've done this work on your ankle or foot. I'm going to put this stretchy tape on because I want to keep you moving. And this will just help keep it warmer for a couple of days to keep the blood flow, you know, better. We'll see what it does. The amount of them that come back and go, that tape, can you put more on? That felt so good. And it's like, cool. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we can. Yeah. 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 So yeah it comes and I always say to people too, yeah, I always say, you know, it, it may, it, we always have, you know, every now and then, but it's very rare that you put the tape on and you get a magic response immediately. You know, people move more or go, wow, I can now squat and I couldn't before or whatever it is. Um, more likely is a slow burn. They get up and they go, yeah, I'm not really sure whether that made any difference or not. And go, we'll just keep it on for three or four days. You're going to see me in a week, leave it on for the first half of the week, then take it off. And then if you miss it, then we know it was doing something. Um, and a lot yeah. of people do come back and say, I didn't think it was actually doing something. Then I took it off and I wish I hadn't because I, I could, you know, my pain returned or, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, mm -hmm. it can definitely be a slow burn. And I think more often it's a slow burn. People's neuroplasticity changing slowly over time rather than, you know, getting a wow moment. Um, the wow moments are great. They, they do really well for your, um, your self-esteem and, and, you <laughs> yeah. know, your, your, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. your practice when they limp in and walk out. Out, but uh, yeah, but it doesn't happen about it very often. You, what you said at the start about you know kinesiology tape is a tool that we add to our toolbox of, of helping people move better and, and actually fix the problem. Where something like rigid tape, you can sometimes get those quicker wow moments because you just limit. You're putting a brace on it that yes. doesn't 
but then you rely on that brace, you know, like it really, once they take that off, it doesn't have an effect either. So I think using the, you know, the rock tape in conjunction with yeah, other modalities, exercises and awareness of how to move, whatever it is, it becomes a really powerful concoction once you kind of put it all together. Yeah. 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 With um, one last question on the K-tape, obviously there's like the pain aspect and, and kind of rehab side of it. Um, you've got a lot of athletes that use it for performance. How does it work on a like performance level? What are the theories behind yeah. that? I think um, predominantly my take on that is more, again, like neuromotor efficiency um, rather than you know, necessarily blood flow or, you know, things from a, a mechanical physiological point of view, I guess, mm-hmm. um, I guess the neuromechanical efficiency or neuromotor efficiency becomes physiological, um, but the pathway to get there. Um, so there's certainly been some studies of looking at um, the effect of the tape on delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS as, as people call it after, you know, the pain you get after exercise, unaccustomed exercise. And some of that research even looks at blood markers like creatine kinase and things like that. And, and finding that with the tape, it was a little, you know, the markers were better than, than without it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's some kind of physiology at, at play there. Um, but in terms of, you know, anecdotally, and I don't think anyone's done this study, but, you know, we, we tape up at lots of events. We might have a, you know, a rock tape booth at the marathon or something like that, you know, say Gold Coast marathon, a big city marathon. And, um, you know, people who say, oh, I always cramp at 32K and, and we take their calves, usually calves for runners, um, take their calves and then they, you know, come back after the, the event and say, oh, fantastic, I didn't, I didn't cramp. Um, you know, and I think, well, you know, what, what is that? Um, I think it probably just ever so subtly changes the way that they're loading the muscle or does it change and give them a bit more variability within their calf contraction so therefore they don't fatigue as much Um, Mm. it happens all the time so it can't just be purely placebo um, that we hear those sort of stories um, and get that sort of feedback so there's something there we always say it doesn't make you better than baseline so if we're talking about performance enhancement um, then if you are a little tighter or a little more sore, you know, if you put tape on, it doesn't make you run faster than you could if you were 100% healthy or jump higher than you could if you're 100% healthy, but it can bring you back to your kind of your optimal. Uh, and it tends to have an effect on delaying fatigue. So there's a few studies around that as well, where you don't necessarily, you know, run faster, jump higher with the tape on, but you can do the task for longer at the same level before you start to drop off with fatigue. So, you know, there is a little bit of evidence around that, but I'm not sure again that they haven't quantified the, what it is. They've just quantified that it happens, but not necessarily then delve back in and go on. Okay. So why? Um, So is it, the neural side of things, is it something to do with the, you know, the fascial system, the, the variability of muscle firing? Um, yeah, we don't really know. Um, they're really tricky studies to do. And that's probably yeah. why we don't know. They'd be very expensive, very invasive. Um, whereas, you know, to put tape on and measure um, how high someone can jump and jump 50 times and watch the people without the tape drop away quicker and the people with the tape sort of maintain their level, maintain their level and then slowly drop off at the end. That's pretty easy. You can do that in a high mm. school gym, really. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the so, low tech ones are, are certainly publish more. Yeah. So do you guys say that it doesn't improve performance more out of fear that you might get banned from these big events for being an enhancement? Yeah. Product? Well, it's, <laughs> Yeah, it's like it does. I think on the box, I can't remember now the the latest packaging. I think it still does say improve performance, but enhanced what performance. we mean by that is enhance performance. There you go. Yeah. So enhance your own performance, but not enhance it more than there you go. Yeah, I've got some here somewhere. I've got a cupboard full of it, but not right in front of me. But not not more than you could before. And even the tagline of you know rock tape go stronger longer is sort of speaking to that of you know that trying to limit your fatigue being able to go stronger or go as strong as you can for longer without dropping off with the fatigue. So the true sort of substance kind of performance enhancing substances that are banned are generally, you have to tick a few boxes, but one of them is that it makes you better than baseline. 
So, you know, the classic you anabolic steroids or whatever. doesn't make you better than baseline. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And occasionally, like we do see a few studies where there is a bit of an improvement, you know, from baseline, it's only small, but like repeat cycling efforts, sprint efforts and stuff like that, when they've done, you know, control groups and taping groups. Normally on those sort of studies, we see no change at, at you know, baseline level when you were taped or not taped, but the, the subsequent follow up ones, you know, after repeat efforts, the, the difference is there. But occasionally you'll see someone who's a bit, you know, a group of people that are a bit better when they've got the tape on, but that would be only very marginal and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it wouldn't be probably a true sort of, you know, major physiological gain. It's probably just more kind of, yeah, the, uh, the, the feeling of, yeah, I'm ready to go. But they're the studies that you bury so that you don't get banned from these events, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll I, don't do I mean, there's so much of it. That, that, yeah. The popularity of kinesiology tape really took off after the Beijing Olympics. Um, so 2008. And that was, you know, there were loads of athletes in every subsequent Olympics. You see loads of, uh, of kinesiology tape. And, and, you know, if it had a, a, a you know, a bad kind of angle, if it was a, you know, a nasty thing to improve your performance, if you like, then it would certainly have been banned by now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's probably more like taking a Panadol really is, uh, you know, just dull it down a little bit and allow you to perform a bit better. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty innocuous, I think. Yeah, I'm joking. By the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. It'd be good if it did improve you that much. Now, well, that's right. Yeah. It's amazing, right? So can people apply this themselves? Obviously, you want them to um, you know, see practitioners and get diagnosed properly. And, you know, but for people who might just have a, at home, have a, a niggle or something that just, is this something that they can, you know, try themselves as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's certainly lots of sort of, you know, self-help YouTube videos. You know, we've got loads on our website, links to different, you know, how to tape a knee, how to tape a back, how to tape your calf or your foot or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously they're the, the very common garden variety, straightforward sort of starting point applications, we would say. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, it's one of those things, the throwaway line of all the, um, you know, medications is, you know, if pain persists, please see your doctor. And it's kind of like that. You know, there's no harm. You're not going to do any harm by putting tape on uh the, the yeah. only risk is skin irritation so if we clear the skin irritation thing and you know your, your skin's pretty robust for for tape then you're not going to do any more harm by putting the tape on if you get a little bit of relief of your niggle um mm. then happy days you get back to what you were doing beforehand and and if it doesn't if you've tried it a couple of times and it reduces the pain a bit but it doesn't sort of you know manage it properly then yeah you need some more advice so you know you yeah. see your, your, um, your practitioner and, and sort of get something diagnosed and and they might still use the tape but it might should be in conjunction with you know exercises that will remedy the problem or, or some other modality that will actually remedy the problem mm. um you know rarely is it rest that's you know stress fractures are probably the big one but uh, apart from that most things do better with you moving you just modify the load and i think that's where you know people get a bit unstuck is yeah you might you might need to tape and also you know adjust your loads a little um you can't usually get away with just tape and bowl along as as you normally are so yeah no, that's great and i'll put a link in the um the show notes to like to rock tape's website because there is a lot of videos on there um on different ideas on self-taping and obviously you can get rock tape on the website as well and like steve just said there's heaps on youtube so yeah if you haven't played with kinesiology tape before or rock tape um yeah have a go it's fun i i, I love the stuff and it's like we've sort of said the whole time, it's a really stretchy tape. So it's not like you're really locking up um, a joint or a muscle. So you can kind of have a bit of fun with it and, and find ways to help improve your movement or reduce pain. Just quickly, mate, I'm just aware of, of your time as well. But you guys are, are now into these things called rock blades and rock pods, which are essentially like a form of cupping. And the rock blade is kind of like fascial scraping. Can you give us a quick rundown um, on these and again people can have a look online or you know you'll find your practitioners may or may not even you know use these on you i love them. i love the rock blades i think they're 
the coolest thing. They look cool for those of you watching visually. It's like a knuckle duster. There are, you pull these out in patience, you cringe, cringe in fear, <laughs> but they feel amazing. Give us a quick rundown yeah. on, uh, on those, mate, if you will. So again, it, it, that's the, the um, I guess, gua sha is the origin of most of the uh, scraping sort of techniques, um, which is a Chinese medicine uh, modality. Um, our take on that again is that basically they're a, you know, they're a neuromodulator. Um, and like you say, when you pick up the, the um, tools like you just showed, the, the knuckle duster looking ones, then they are a little bit, ooh, you know, confronting for the patient. Um, threat level goes up. Um, but normally once they've been treated with it, that sort of consistent edge of, uh, of, you know, smooth metal edge that you treat them with, I think they do then kind of, relax a little bit more and you know i try not to take offense but a lot of the patients will go no i like the that treatment tool better than your hands my bony fingers and thumbs um you know get into to some spots where the the smoothness of the the tool and the predictability of the tool mm. um can often help relax them a little bit more um certainly from a therapist point of view they're a great hand saver um you know treating like you know trying to do some soft tissue work around you know various areas of the body it can be um hard yakka on on you physically so sometimes using the treatment tools and it's definitely a, a case again of an adjunct like you know you you might do an assessment with uh, with your hands and and then bring in the tools um, but interestingly once you start using the tools more often they are a good tissue assessment in themselves as well so you do get to feel a lot with the tissue um, when you're using the tool you can feel certain like little vibrations and little tight spots mm -hmm. So can the patients when you're using those. So if you were, you know, sliding that, and, and we do generally go gently, you know, it's easy to go hard, it's hard to go light. That's what we mm -hmm. kind of say in our courses with these things. So if you back right off and you just do a really gentle slide along the tissue with the, the tool, you'll feel little uh, asymmetries, little, little grisly spots for want of a better word. And some of that's normal. So you go to the unaffected side and go, oh, yeah, it's the same over here. But if it's not, and it's the symptomatic area, then, and the patient goes, oh, I can feel that. It's like, you know, yeah. corrugation in a road kind of thing. And, and, you know, that might represent that area of tightness that you can then work on. Um, and you can be much more sensitive sometimes with the tool, which people kind of find really difficult to get their head around. But mm. once you get attuned to that sort of feeling, um, they can be a really nice um, assessment and, you know, allow you a different way of feeling the, the tissue. So, but definitely depending on the, the rate, so whether you're, you're treating fast with those or treating slow, how deep you're treating. And, and as I said, we often go really, really light um, with the tools. We can affect different receptors in the system and, and have a, you know, either an upregulating effect. So if sometimes we can use them, you know, as a rapid rate and we can kind of hype things up. If, you know, if you were treating a foot and you were trying to get someone to find their, you know, the little intrinsic muscles that they just haven't used for donkey's years, well, you can do a little bit of a rapid technique and, and kind of heighten their sensory awareness of their, their foot and then get them to do their exercises and you kind of, mm. you know, already got them fired up and ready to go. And then obviously we can use them more as a, you know, deep tissue relaxation type of tool as well. And again, that's where it really does save your hands when, you, when you're using them. So they are a really versatile tool. Um, we've got little um, complimentary online course that goes for like 20 minutes on both tape and blades, which you'll be able to link through, you know, find yeah, them on the website awesome. under our, our courses. So if people are interested in saying, well, you know, what's, what's the philosophy behind the tape or what's the philosophy behind the blades, you can, you know, sign up to your 20 minute course and, and just have a bit of a look and see what, you know, does it resonate with the way you practice and, and does it make you sort of want to go, yeah, I want to, I want to know more about that or, mm. you know, no, that's, that's all I need to know. Um, I've found and the then blades. The pods. Yeah, go, go. Oh, sorry, sorry. So the pods um, are basically, like you said, you know, our version of carping. Um, so they're a silicon pod. There's uh, one, the standard set has a, a small and a large kind of um, pod within them. So four, four small, four large off the top of my head. Now we have the XL version, which is actually bigger and bigger again, if you like. Um, so you get three of the 
the, the red ones, which are a bit bigger, and then three of the black ones, which are quite big. So for the areas of bigger real estate, really, so low backs, thighs, some people's calves, not mine, but uh, that might need a bigger pod. Uh, the interesting thing about, well, cupping generally is that, you know, it's the only thing we've got that is a decompressive, a for, decompressive force in terms of soft tissue treatment. So everything else, whether it's spiky ball, lacrosse ball, um, blades, hands, um, anything, foam rollers are all compressive. So you squashing the tissue. Uh, with the cups, when we apply the cup and we apply sort of a traction force on the cup while it's attached to the tissue, we can actually draw tissue apart. We can pull the layers apart a little bit with that. So it's the only way that we can really get a good decompressive force. And again, that's just a, a really novel stimulus for people's brains because we don't do that normally, unless you stick the vacuum cleaner, you know, hose on you or something. <laughs> but apart from work. that, yeah, apart from that, we don't really have a, a modality that does that. So, so we can get some really powerful results with that from tissue relaxation, pain relief, um, you know, connecting dots between brain and body part. Um, mm. The good thing about the silicon cups, they don't, they don't glide real well. So if you want to do gliding cups, when we usually use the, um, you know, the, the vacuum seal, you know, plastic yeah. ones. But the good thing about these is you can stick them on and make people move. Um, and if they fall off, they bounce because they're yeah. rubber. Basically, they're a silicon yeah. product. So they don't clatter across the floor like the, the plastic ones. You don't break the valves like you do on the plastic ones if they fall to the floor. So putting them on a body part, we can, once, we're, once it's attached, I can manipulate it. We call that an external glide because the therapist is doing it. So it's an externally applied force. But one of the most powerful things is getting an internal glide. So stick it on uh, a calf muscle or stick a couple of cups along the calf and get someone to walk, you know, and that way the tissue is sliding and gliding underneath this uh, decompressed area, yeah. this pinned sort of area of muscle. So it's a really nice way to incorporate, again, treatment and movement at the same time. It's a weird feeling. Yeah, absolutely. But if you haven't had your uh, your feet, the bottoms of your feet cupped, you know, you're missing out. You know, that, that feels fantastic. Around yeah. Around heel, it's amazing. Hey? Yeah, around that sort of uh, medial calcaneal tubicle, bit of, you know, plantar fascia irritation there. You get the cup on that and it feels wonderful. So Yeah. It's, but essentially, it's all the same principle, right? It's changing that input to change the output for pretty yeah, much yeah, all the modalities. I yeah, I think they can all come back to that. And obviously with certain things, there's a physical component to it as well or a physiological component. So when we've got the cup on, we're getting physiological traction of the tissue. So we can get some, you know, separation of layers. And um, if we're using the blades, we're getting some of that sort of massage effect of, you know, compression of tissues, moving fluid around and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So there's definitely for all of the modalities, there is a physiological kind of component to it but you can't dismiss it from the, the neuro part of it as well. So um, we, we have a, a good association with um, Eric Cobb, who runs uh, Z Health, it's called in the US, but we would say Z Health because it's just the letter Z, the letter yeah. Z, okay? So if you want to look at Z Health or Z Health, as yeah. they call it, um, he, his quote that, that I always refer to is, everybody's treating neurology, but most of us are doing it by mistake. So... We, we kind of don't intend when you put your hands on someone to alter the inputs and alter the outputs, but you can't get away from the fact that you are. So yeah. everything we do with a patient is affecting their neurology, whether you like it or not. So, mm. and it's really hard to separate out what, what was in their head, what was from their head and what was from the, the body part, you know, it's, uh, they're so intertwined. So uh, there's some really good brain based stuff that, um, that Z Health do as well that, uh, you know, we have a good collaboration with them in, uh, in, you know, they use our products in their courses because it's that extension of what you do with your hands or send someone home with stuff. Um, and just their philosophies kind of resonate really well with us as well. Yeah, nice. I'll check them out for sure. That sounds really cool. So yeah, if you haven't had cupping done, it's something you should, should experience. It's, it's a weird feeling, but it's, it feels nice. I, I like, I've got the rock pods as well. I use the rock blades. Um, and yeah, for me, I find, I probably use the rock blades more than the, the pods. So that's just me and probably just, you know, habits I've formed. Um, on myself, I use the rock pods. 
more yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I do find the rock blades, uh, and like you're saying, probably more because I'm actually treating, and you know, rather than just sticking a cup on, and I don't know, it's probably more me integrating that more into my practice more. But the blades, I find, are a really cool tool. Um, and I'll find that you know I've had patients that have um, bought them themselves or already have them just you know from their own journey and you show them how to use them a certain way for the problem they've, they've got or what we're trying to fix and it's something that's pretty easy like you said it, it doesn't have to be pushed hard it's it's quite a simple tool to use and, and even though it's a big rigid chunk of metal the, the blade um, it is funny how much feeling you get through it like you were saying you do feel it, all those little corrugations and, and like you said before you know patients will say you know, you go back over that same spot and they'll be like, oh, that feels better. It feels like you've, you've ironed that knot out or ironed that bit out. Um, so you feel change both as a practitioner and as a, and as a patient. So, yeah, jump on um, the Rock Tape website. I'll put that below in the show notes. Um, because there's lots of stuff on there from, from tape to different um, ointments, you know, like massage rubs and things um, to the rock blades. You've got a few different versions of rock blades. Now you've got the, what's the Hawk yeah. one? Yeah, the Mohawk one Mohawk. is a smaller one. I've got it here somewhere. If people are watching, that's the little Mohawk one, which can be relative size. doesn't look little unless I give it something to, you know, so that's the, the Mohawk on top of the one that uh, Paul was showing before, the, the mullet. So, uh, the mallet, sorry. So that's um, just a couple of different angles. So around sort of little areas that can be good around hands and feet, the different little um, angles can be nice, um, less threatening when you pick it up as well than the knuckle duster version. Um, right. So yeah, that, that's a different uh, looking get, tool. <laughs> and you might get that one through customs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but effectively, they all do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. always say check them in. Don't, don't, don't. Uh, you know, trust the uh, the security guys that they'll believe you when you say they're a massage tool. Uh, Especially when you're always it against your knuckle. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What are you talking about? It's a <laughs> yeah. ma massage tool. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, are you sure I can't so, get upgrades? Yeah, <laughs> that's um, right. <laughs> yeah, jump on. Check out the. Um, you know, the different massage tools, the rock pods are on the website. And, and like Steve said, there's um, some free courses on there that you can have a look at and, and, and learn even more about this deep dive into, you know, the different products that Rock Tape um, offers. But hopefully this gives you guys a bit of an intro into, well, yeah, the, the blades and the rock pods, but more importantly, the, the kinesiology tape. There's been a lot of questions around it. So I hope that gives you more info and, and kind of um, a little bit more context around you know, who can use it, how you can use it, um, you know, some of the different benefits and things that the people experience from, um, you know, pain relief to, to helping with improving um, and getting a better awareness of, of movement. Um, you know, so jump on and, and use some of this kinesiology tape if, if you feel you need to or if your practitioner is using it, you'll now, now have a better understanding as to uh, why and, and what it's trying to achieve. Um, in conjunction with the other tools that your practitioner's probably using. But thanks again, Steve. I really appreciate you coming on and, and walking us through the, well, through Rock Tape company, basically. <laughs> it's been a little inside yeah. look into, to everything you guys um, do. And if you're a practitioner listening in, um, Rock Tape offers a, a bunch of different courses all around Australia. Generally, probably a little bit trickier at the moment with um, with some of the COVID restrictions. But... Um, I've noticed there's more courses popping up now again. Um, so that's yeah, all we're back. You're back. Yeah, back to in-person courses. And we also still have all our uh, recorded ones from last year. We were recording Zoom courses last year. And so we've got a number of different online courses too. So, you know, for people who are still kind of, you know, happy to do stuff at home and, and kind of work through at their own pace, there's all those as well as the in-person ones back up and running now as well. Yeah, but I must say the in-person ones are always fun. You guys do do run yeah. a good workshop and there's nothing like getting in there and having a play and a feel and, you know, getting to use some of these or depending on what course you're doing, um, getting to actually, you know, use the, the blade on a, a, a buddy there that's, you know, doing the course with you or learning how to tape and 
and actually running through it, it's kind of nothing like experiencing that firsthand with the you know the teacher there, obviously overlooking and giving you feedback. I found that's been really helpful um, over the years. But yeah, otherwise the online stuff is there too. So check it out. Links will be in the bottom of the the show notes um, to their website. So jump on. It's all on there. Yeah, courses online in person. Yeah. Everything you'll find at rocktape.com.au. Is that right? Yep. 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 And that's right. Social media. Is yep. Your... Rocktape Australia will be Instagram and, and Facebook. Um, yep. So you'll be able to see all sorts of different stuff on, on that, those uh, channels as well. But thanks again, Steve. I really appreciate your time and all your, your knowledge and everything you guys do. I yeah, really appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of people will take a lot away from, uh, from this call. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for having us.